lucky we are to call this beautiful continent home. Yes, this paradise is not without peril, but just look at what we have to work with. In the years to come, this responsibility will fall to you and all its potential will be your possibility. So we promise to do all we can today to share all our knowledge and skills, to ensure you inherit a just society, to give you access to the finance and resources you need to build the best Africa possible. But none of that will matter if we don't protect this beautiful continent we call home. And so we pledge to use every ounce of our creativity, our ingenuity, our tenacity. All 37,000 of us, shoulder to shoulder with millions of you, to bring the most important possibility of our time to life. So your world, dear tomorrow, is shaped by the power of zero. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Steven Siaka. I'm responsible for public sector and growth capital solutions at uh, APSA. In studio with me today is Lula Matakula, who is one of our energy and infrastructure uh, experts and will be my co-host today. We are excited this afternoon to host yet another installment of the APSA Insights where we engage with policy makers and captains of industry. We do this in order to get this sand shifting insights that will inform our everyday decisions. And today we are delighted to have this exclusive engagement with the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy. Our focus will be on the South African um, energy policy. As you know, the department is seized and preoccupied with many things, let me remind you of some of the focus areas contained in their proposed statement. The department uh, is key to make sure that we have access to electricity at, at affordable prices, to improving energy regulation and governance as the custodian of energy and policy regulation in the country. And most importantly, the department is seized with stimulating economic growth and sustainable de development. In doing so, they know they have to be cognizant in managing energy-related environments, as you know that environmental issues have taken the center stage. And last but not least, the department is seized with making sure that they, there's a secure of supply uh, through diversity. Governments across the world are reviewing their energy and electricity policies, planning and regulation in order to ensure a resilient, affordable and efficient supply of energy resources. In South Africa, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, has made it even more urgent for government to implement energy supply measures that will spare the much needed economic uh, growth, investment, and job creation uh, in this sector. So before we start our proceedings today, allow me to have someone who will give you a warm welcome, our chief executive, for Corporate and Investment Banking, Mr. Charles uh, Rousson. How are you, Charles? Very well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much that you could join. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Honorable Minister Mintashe, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to have you join us today. Thank you. 
It would, of course, have been wonderful for all of us to be able to meet in person. But the COVID-19 COVID global pandemic, which we've all been living with for around a year and a half now, has caused us all to review how we live <clears throat> and how we work. It has also impacted how many of us are engaging with important stakeholders such as yourselves and how we serve our clients with more innovative solutions. Minister, we recently hosted the South Africa Tomorrow Investor Investment Conference together with the JSE and Citibank, addressed by His Excellency the President of South Africa and several members of his cabinet. The conference had investors from the UK, USA, UAE, and the Africa, uh, Asia Pacific region. What was very clear coming out of that conference is that despite some challenges, South Africa has a positive story to tell and foreign investors are ready to hear it. Some of the foreign investors who spoke to us at ABSA said they've been running such large structural underweights on South Africa for so long that when they started looking at the market again, they were very impressed by the opportunities. There were, of course, concerns about South Africa's economy, particularly given the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. And another key factor to unlock the economic growth in a post-pandemic in environment is energy. The shortage of electricity and regular outages in recent years have underscored the importance of a stable energy supply to achieving faster economic growth in South Africa. It is in this context that ABSA has over the years supported government's efforts towards addressing the electricity shortage. To that end, we've been a significant supporter of government's renewable IPP program since its establishment in 2010. It is of course difficult to speak about energy today without due consideration for, for clean energy. We're mindful of the fact that climate change presents a material, urgent global challenge with significant socioeconomic consequences and Africa's above average vulnerability to climate change. ABSA's commitment has seen us finance 33 deals or 46% of South Africa's renewables projects to date. As a leading African financial institution, our strength lies in our connections to various stakeholders across sectors and the economy. We can play a shaping and sustainability. Our vision is to leverage the strength to channel financing into solutions that support inclusive growth and environmental protection, growing ESG, environmental, social and governance impact. ABSA Corporate and Investment Bank aims to finance or arrange 100 billion rand for ESG related projects by 2025. In addition to which, Relationship Banking plans to finance 250 megawatts or 2.5 billion of renewable power. We will work to help our, our customers and clients transition towards more sustainable sources of energy. Public private partnerships have been key in driving sustainable growth for the betterment of the economy and our people. And we are grateful to you for making yourselves available for this important discussion. We look forward to an enlightening and hopefully very engaging session. Thank you very much and back to you, Steve. Thank you so much, Charles, uh, for that uh, warm welcome. And uh, I've already seen that people are posting their questions on Slido. We definitely want to encourage you to post your question on Slido. If you scroll down, you'll be able to post your questions. And immediately after our minister has spoken, we'll definitely jump into the uh, Q&A. Now into introducing the minister. Mr. Gwede Mantache was appointed minister of the mineral resources in February 2018. Following the six democratic elections in 2019, the portfolio was expanded to include energy. 
Uh, Minister Manstache received a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of South Africa, UNISA, in 1997, where he also completed a Bachelor of Commerce Honours in 2002. He also holds a Master's degree from the University of Vet acquired in 2018, 2008. He also recently completed his Master's in Business Administration, MBA, uh, through Mancosa. So our minister really has an extensive experience in both the energy and, and mining sector, a very well-known person to us who doesn't need any further introduction. Welcome, Minister. Thank you so much that you could uh, join us. Maybe before you do your address, uh, you really encouraged a lot of us when you completed your MBA uh, currently. Uh, I just want to find out where does the energy come from? You know, you, uh, you have a tight schedule. Uh, how was it for you? If you are working in energy, you must have energy or something. So how do you work with energy you don't have energy? <laughs> That's why I get the energy. <laughs> Thank you so much. We will then hand over to you for your opening remarks. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. I can see you are two. Let me say Program Directors. And let me start with just basic principles. One policy is never static. Uh, it is always in a state of becoming, uh, precisely because policy talks to reality. It needs to be managed. Changes need, must be guided. And when the, there is a policy framework, our duty as government, uh, working with the state, is to execute and implement. Currently, we have a policy called Integrated Resource Plan, uh, which is a policy that guides us on energy matters, uh, with a particular focus on energy generation. It talks to now and it talks to the future. In every security of supply, energy security of supply, uh, and moving to low carbon emissions, sound contradictory, but they're complementary. Uh, I'm using this term uh, deliberately, that we're moving from high carbon emission to low carbon emission, as opposed to the loosely used phrase of moving from coal to renewable. Uh, because that is a, a narrow conception. We are moving from high carbon emissions to low carbon emissions. We must never move from the known to the unknown. Let me tell you what we know. Uh, what we know is that uh, we are heavily dependent on coal for energy. Uh, it has contributed to the economy uh, for many decades, it continues to, con to contribute to the export of commodities. Uh, it has been at the heart of energy, of electricity generation for many years. But South Africa is a signatory to the Paris uh, Agreement. And therefore, that commitment is not symbolic, it's a real commitment. Uh, so it is important for me to outline that actually in South Africa, we, we, we generate electricity from 16 coal power stations, uh, which uh, give us 75% of South African electricity. Uh, and we have got uh, another about 20 just under 20 from liquid energy. And we've got under 10 from renewables. Leave this contestation, that seems as if it's right between coal and, uh, and renewables. It is a reality that we're facing. With that commitment, we, you must remember of the liquids, we include nuclear there, uh, which is covered which is the most efficient energy generator in South Africa today. Lowest cost. Uh, and many people, when they uh, discredit nuclear, say it's very expensive. 
is costly on commissioning, is costly on decommissioning. It's very efficient when it is operational. Uh, now, let me go to what we have. What we have is uh, a program to decommission a number of coal power stations. And the plan is that 10,500 megawatts will be decommissioned uh, uh, by 2030. Now, now, if you decommission those those power stations by 2030, what happens? What is not announced is the formula to replace that energy. And my emphasis is that let's be certain about replacing that energy because the crisis we're facing today is a function of reluctance to start a build program that talks to the reduction of energy supply. Uh, in uh, 1996, we want that electricity supply surplus will be uh, exhausted by 2007. Uh, the government was reluctant to move, hoped that the private sector will replace uh, that energy. It never happened. When they started building Kusile and Midupi, uh, it was late, and a number of design and build uh, mistakes were committed, and were paying the price today in the form of load training. Now, what do we think we should do? IRP give us the framework to, to deal with that situation. We say we are not discounting the importance of getting uh, ESCO more efficient uh, and uh, continue to supply reliable energy. But at this point in time, Despite 45,000 megawatts connected, uh, ESCOM hardly uh, cope with the 1,000 megawatts. Now, if that is the reality, what do we do in the department? And ESCOM is in the Department of Public Enterprises. In the Department of Energy, we're doing what is called supplementary work to what ESCOM, what ESCOM is falling short of. Uh, but at the time, we absorb the blame as if we are the primary energy generator. We're not. We are custodians of energy policy. But generation is in ESCOM primarily, and we supplement it. We, this is what is in the IRP. In the IRP 2019, uh, we said uh, we're taking into account the transition that is just as we do the word decommissioning about 5,400 megawatts of coal power generation, which will increase to 10,500 in 2030. That is what is going to be decommissioned. Uh, and 35,000 megawatts by 2050, meaning that we're phasing out coal generation. But the, the biggest debate that we're having is if we do away with um, uh, with coal generated power station, is it a movement from coal power generation to renewables? At this point in time, PV and wind is having a shortcoming of having no base load. And therefore, unless we address that reality, we may run into a different kind of a problem. Uh, now, in preparation, therefore, instead of new capacity, 18,000 megawatts from renewable energy, wind and solar by 2030, uh, 2,500 megawatts from nuclear post-2030, and that nuclear is also counterposed to hydrogen from INGA if that project is accelerated. 1,000 megawatts uh, in 2023 and 2000 megawatts 2027 of gas, as well as hydro power and battery storage. Now, that is what is on the plan. I've come across a number of people saying that IRP is outdated, it must be revised. Uh, I always remind them that no, 
policy formulation is not an ad hoc exercise. Because if it becomes ad hoc, it means you give away your right to manage the thing. Now, ESCOM has also started pre uh, preparatory work and the planning process for decommunization of power plants located in Pumalaga. Now, at the beginning of this debate, which is unfortunately so polarized, that we stop uh, really thinking, is that it was a decommissioned coal power stations. And our bank, uh, we banked on the availability of gas in Mozambique and said, gas is going to be a major factor in the transition. And we discovered our own gas in Southern and, uh, and in Iqua, uh, shale gas in, in Beaufort West is promising a lot with 34 bottles of that gas in laboratories to check the quality and the uh, extent of it being economical. So gas is promising, but we have noticed a new attack on gas as well. Uh, basically attacking fossil fuel as a source of energy. And our argument is that we are a developing economy. Uh, we cannot pretend as if we are Germany. Uh, Germany can afford them by closing all the power stations. And it has a space to say, we're changing that decision, we'll close them in 2038 and begin to uh, increase a coal as a source of energy. So that is the comfort of being a developed economy. And it can afford that because there's a neighbor, a neighbor called France, which is 75% nuclear generated energy. And therefore they can actually support one another. We don't have a France as our neighbor. We are a developing economy. Our view is that into the future, mixed technologies are our best option. Are our best option. Uh, as we reduce coal, Gas, we must use optimally. Nuclear, we must introduce back. And there are quite a number of our countries that are opting for, for nuclear, which is clean energy technology. Uh, many say cost is inhibiting. And my argument is, yes, it is. But when we issue a request for information and request for proposal, we are testing the market. If the response from the market says, we can build a nuclear power station, even if it's in modular form, let's go for it. Um, and, and that's where we are. And my own view is that into the future, uh, as we develop the battery industry, the announcement of ITC and Sasol on hydro green energy is also an additional development to moving green, but also taking into account the importance of uh, base load, because if you don't have base load, you have surplus energy during the day and plunge yourself into darkness at night, and you must be quite careful about that. So this is, my, in my own view, what we should be discussing, including with the banks, because the banks sometimes uh, put undue pressure to say, we're not funding uh, this technology, we'll only fund that technology and actually force us to move in an unplanned way to a new technology that is funded by the banks and collapse one technology that we've relied on for a long time without a proper transition. I always explain the term transmission and uh, encompasses uh, the concept of a journey, not an event. So we must move to this transition carefully and ensure that we've security of energy supply as we move to low carbon emissions. I think as an introduction, I should stop at that and deal with the questions as they come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mantasha, for your insightful uh, address. Um, We'll now move into our Q question, Q question and answer session. But I'd like to note that Mr. Mantashi doesn't come on his own. He comes with his colleague, Ndogo Zongwabe, who is the DDG in the Mineral Policy and Promotion. So, so welcome, Dogozo. We look forward to also engaging with you. 
Um, I'll kick off the question and answer session. Um, Minister Mantashe, the market is excited about President Ramaphosa's recent announcement that companies can now procure up to 100 megawatts of power without a license from NURSA. And obviously there are many questions with respect to this announcement. How do you um, see this panning out and do you believe that we have the infrastructure to support this rollout of, of power? My background is in the trade union, and I'm used to taking a long list of questions. But if you want me to deal with one question at a time, I will do that. Uh, let's <laughs> correct this uh, 100 megawatts of embedded generation. And lifting that threshold to that, uh, I hear you, you formulate this without license from NASA. Uh, I don't know if you listen to uh, President Ramaphosa. He said, Every project will have to be registered with NERSA. And NERSA must revise a schedule two to develop conditions for permit to operate. Um, uh, in the department, we've had a discussion trying to understand the distinction between a permit and a license. And then and, and we came to the conclusion that the actual, the, at, the, at the essence of the issue is accelerated of the process for people to start getting the permit to operate. Uh, but you cannot allow it to be a free for all because you'll cause a chaos in the country. So our view is that we'll do that uh, in the coming week. We're hoping to issue uh, the draft uh, schedule two, which is amended after the announcement and we lend it to the president so that we reconcile our approach. A question that we've asked ourselves, we've not answered that. What is the objective? Where do we move to? Are we deregulating energy? Or are we deregulating renewable energy? Or are we making it easier to operate? That question is being debated internally. We'll answer it and schedule two as revised and gazetted. We'll talk to that issue. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mantache. I guess you, 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 you could have seen we're starting with a top of mind kind of uh, questions. The next one, really, it's around the car powership project, which uh, was the preferred bidder uh, for supplying emergency power and did not secure the uh, you know, environmental authorization. Obviously, this was a setback for efforts to produce power quickly for South Africa and by doing so, curtailing load shedding. Are you able to give us uh, some insights or high-level insights uh, around that? Uh, are there any plans? Should it not um, uh, win the, the courts or should it not be approved uh, environmentally? Um, one of the things I, I don't like is to talk to conspiracies and all that. I prefer dealing with facts. You know, much earlier, we, we picked out the information that the car power ship is going to be frustrated in many ways. One, the environmental assessment. Two, uh, Transnet is going to refuse them uh, anger rights in the ports. Three, ESCOM is going to refuse to buy that energy. And lastly, it must be kept in court for a long time. Now, we tried our best to understand uh, the reason for all this. Uh, we have not discovered it, so we were quite keen to follow developments around that. If it is gas, the company that is taking us to court say there was some uh, corruption and all that in the process is also dependent on gas supply. So we, we don't know. Uh, what kind of gas that is preferred uh, as opposed to what? Number two, uh, if it is an emergency procurement, we must behave as if it is emergency. And it, we must not deploy, uh, uh, deal with it as if it's like any other contract that is given. So that is a case that is uh, in, in, in court. Uh, uh, chambers of Commerce in the Eastern Cape 
are objecting to the Department of Environmental Affairs. They are appealing the decision. So it's going to be quite an interesting case study for all of us. And in future, we can talk to it. Yeah, some of the matters are at, at court. Thank you, colleagues who have joined. I see you, Kiabetu Lepule, Blondi, Mashata, Nubeko, Tembu and Tony Curry have uh, just asked um, part of your question. So please continue to post your question on, on Slido. Over to you, Lulama. I offer my colleague, Tians, an opportunity to pose a question. So over to you, Tians. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Honorable Minister. Um, question from my side, uh, you know, we're in the middle of uh, the bidding exercise for renewables round five. Do you have any um, Clear indication okay. from a timeline perspective um, when we can expect uh, the gas IPP program to be procured and also the next round of renewables round six. Come again, come again. So the question a is from a from a timeline perspective, when you expect uh, the procurement for the gas IPP program and also for the next round of renewables. To, to start? Uh, let me give that to Jacob Mbell. I hope he's here because he will give you the date. We have clear dates on all those. That uh, pit window 5 on pit apps, pit window 6 and pit window 7. We have to have days up to pit window 7. You'll get that. Um, and the, the, the gas. Uh, uh, procurement, if there's a date for that. If Jacob Mbele is around, can you give us the date, please? Good, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and good afternoon, Minister. The guest program is planned for December. Uh, the RFP is planned for December of this year, early January 2022. Thank you. And the big windows. We, we, we have issued a uh, bid window five. We are planning to issue bid window six in August, uh, September, uh, this year still, yes. And bid window seven? Bid window seven will be early next year. There you are. Thank you, Minister. Um, I know that my colleague Shirley Weber also has a burning question that he'd like to ask the minister. So I'll give her an opportunity before we go into our live feed. Thank Shirley? you, Lulama. Thank you, Lulama. Thank you, Minister. Um, Honourable Minister, there's been a few areas of reorganisation happening. For example, the forming of the National Oil Company you know, with Petro SA, SFF and iGas being combined. Um, you know, that was one of the first reorganizations as well that was mentioned. Um, maybe just a bit of progress on that and the intention of the national oil company there now in your bigger energy policy picture. If you don't mind. Okay. Um, let me try that. There was a would do that, but let me just give it a first kick and allow the was to add or uh, uh, all of them can talk to that. Up to all, what we have done, we look into the state of our state owned entities in our portfolio. Uh, one of the shocks that I found when I came there was to have a company called I guess which had a board and it was operating fully. And when we looked into it, he had a board of eight people. It was employing two people. And they said, but uh, what is the point to have two uh, people in the workforce and they have a board of eight? So we said, it's not workable, it's not sustainable. Uh, we looked at uh, Petro SA. We described Petro SA as a typical example of asset stripping. Where people stripped it of anything. In in 2014, Petro had 27 billion rand reserves. When I worked in there, it had no reserves. And it was battling to cope with the day-to-day -day costs. 
Uh, we looked into all options. There were, there were very strong proposals that we must sell it. And we said, when we did our deep, uh, deep dive, we said, no, if we sell it, we will be meeting the actually the objectives of the artist strippers. They want us to sell Petro SA for a song and they go and, and catch the other side and make a, a kill out of it. Uh, we, we looked in all options, we came to a position that we should match, I guess, which is quite uh, uh, liquid. And we must, uh, with uh, SFF and Petro SA. Petro SA is, is, is battling, but a lot of potential. It's two drill rigs were sold, we must rebuild it. And we said we must have to match this three and form a national oil company. We've done our first phase. We're now in cabinet to say, these are the options that are at our disposal. We want to choose one, we have recommended Judge. one option. So uh, if that is approved, then we move to that option. It will take us to the build phase of the new national petrol company. I don't know, Makubela on the horse, we want to add anything. This one, this three, yeah. This Thank three. you, Mr. Thank you. Shall I go? Program Please Derek. Do. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Good afternoon, everyone. So just to add maybe um, a little bit more on, on what the intention is, because part of the question was, what is the intention with the, the macro organization step that has been taken in, in terms of the, the self entities? One, the main issue is for us to ensure that uh, South Africa really plays in the petroleum space and that South Africa as a country optimizes uh, on the value that it derives from its own resources. So we're looking at it creating a company, a strong company that will have capabilities to play in the upstream space. And in the upstream space, we're looking at uh, being a leader and leading uh, in terms of exploration activities for the country. But also we're looking at playing um, in the midstream space. And in the long term, we are saying, we also want to look at possibilities to play um, a, a downstream and to have a strong presence um, as, as a national company. And I must say that um, we, we're doing this on the back of thorough research and ben benchmarking that we've done with major producing uh, oil producing countries. And, and, and if we look at uh, those major countries that we've looked at, that's the trend that they set up. You set up a strong national uh, oil company that plays in the entire value chain to ensure that we extract max maximum benefit for the country. But also, let me also say this. Um, a lot of questions that we get while we are busy with this process and while we're busy with the upstream petroleum bill has a lot to do with um, um, what our thoughts are or what the thinking is in the light of this shift from high carbon to low uh, carbon emissions and, and the scarcity of funding towards a, a oil, um, particularly oil projects. And we're saying we're wanting to do this, keeping in mind the need for us to deploy clean technologies. So we're looking at clean development. We're looking at um, clean exploitation of these resources because from where we sit, it's very much aligned and it sits very well within the country's um, um, oceans economy agenda. And we want to ensure that this sector really plays a role and contributes hugely into the, uh, the, that uh, oceans economy for the country. Thank you, Minister. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, thank you, Minister. Um, Another th topical issue or, or question that keeps coming up, and thanks you, Kiabetsu, for also raising that, is just the question regarding the status of the unbundling of ESKIM. Um, the question is just around what is the status and the timing around that. And also we've received a question from, from Blondie just around that if with, with respect to people that are planning on going off-grid solutions, is there allocation set aside to that? And what are the plans around um, that? You will remember that uh, when this uh, portfolio was put together, one of the first issues that we, we will put on the table for discussion 
Uh, it never got a real decent discussion from the sector. Uh, was that uh, it will be to the advantage of the country to have a competitive generation company uh, outside of ESCOM, uh, so that you open up competition at the level of generation. And we thought that it will have a good impact on prices, to pull prices down. Uh, that debate was never really opened and uh, taken to the conclusion. But the developments in the, in the generation space are pointing to the correctness of that position. Uh, the, 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 the new uh, threshold for uh, embedded generation 200 uh, point to that direction. Uh, if you look into a, a number of companies that are taking advantage of all the IPP proposal, it points to that direction. But what we are doing as a department is that we are having a bill back to parliament that we're taking back to parliament, uh, which uh, is talking to the role of transmission. That uh, transmission, uh, there was Ismo bill that we stopped in 2013. And the room that we stopped in Ismo bill was simple. Uh, you don't establish a market uh, place when there is no market. At that time, there was no market. Uh, but we wanted to establish the marketplace. Now we're taking that bill back to Parliament to establish the small bill and, and define the role of transmission as that of a market and a wheeler. So that if uh, there is a cheap electricity in Cape Town, I am in the city of Kala in the Eastern Cape, I can buy energy from Cape Town, uh, transmission will wheel it to Kala. And, and that, that is what we're doing. So the unbundling of ESCOM is uh, uh, taking that direction, but details are with the Minister of Public Enterprise. But I'm telling it our, in our responsibility as the custodian of policy, we are actually trying to promulgate a legislation that defines the role of transmission. And transmission, therefore, will be unbundled from the rest, and then there will be competition at both generation and a distribution, uh, leave the question of uh, the capacity of municipalities at the level of distribution. I want to get into that. You want to end the host? I can see your eyes. <laughs> no, Minister. Okay. Thank okay. you, Minister. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you so much. And on, on this issue of willing that you have mentioned, um, suppose, I just want to get clarity there. Suppose people... Um, uh, generate uh, more than they can uh, contain. You are saying that 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 could be sold to the grid. You see, you see that future going in that space. I just wanted to get clarity on that. Uh, I normally describe this as, as the Dutch model, you see. Uh, because if you look into the Dutch model, transmission is a standalone company. It buys electricity from all sorts of generators and wills to the consumers. And we're hoping that ultimately we'll end up with that situation. We also have our colleague. Um, I'm seeing the questions for those who have joined. And uh, after BAFTIC, uh, we will be coming uh, back uh, to you to take some questions from our colleagues and clients. So BAFTIC has a, a question that he wants to pose to you. Thank you. And over to you, BAFTIC. Thank you very much, Steve, and uh, good afternoon again, uh, Minister. Thank you very much for your time and this opportunity to speak to you. Uh, just one point, uh, Minister, that I'd like to pose to you. It's probably more suited to the DTI as opposed to your department, but nonetheless, let me try. Um, you know, clearly, if we look at the um, RMTPP program, risk mitigation program, uh, emergency power, we look at the latest iteration of um, the, the, the date 5 REAP uh, RFP, there's clearly a, a change in that the weighting for evaluation of projects has actually shifted to 90% in favor of price uh, and value for money and 10% really on, on the ED economic development criteria. I'd like to ask you um, or, or any of your team, how does that actually reconcile with government's uh, move to towards sort of job creation and localization, given that um, you know we have not historically seen a lot of uh, 
wind manufacturing uh, you know facilities example tower facilities or uh, nacelles or you know on the solar it's more assembly plants for modules as opposed to proper um, you know grassroots manufacturing how do we actually reconcile you know 10% localization or 10% weighting on ed with the localization requirement and job creation in the country thank you um I will give that to Didi Jim Bell. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, Bafti, maybe I think the way one will respond to this is that we, we need to separate between the 10% for ED and the drive for localization. The drive for localization is driven by DTIC through uh, designation. So the 10% the is in addition to what DTIC has already, for example, panels in, in PV, there are components that have been designated uh, by DTIC. So on top of the 10% that is there for economic development, you still need to comply. So the best way to drive localization is actually through the designation that the DTIC is doing. And there are discussions um, around that. Um, thanks. Thank you, Jacob. Um, one other question, Minister. Um, uh, on the embedded generation, the, the 100 megawatts, up to 100 megawatts without the requirement for a generation license potentially, but still having a requirement to register with NERSA, what are government's plans? I mean, 100 megawatts is a pretty big plant. It is currently bigger than the largest solar plants, uh, the cap in, in South Africa, 75 for solar, and it's somewhere in between the, the wind and the solar uh, you know, maximum wind size is 140 megawatts. So uh, this may typically be too big for uh, you know many uh, industrial users or commercial users. What are government's plans with regards to potentially net metering? I mean, are there are there moves afoot for potentially to look at, you know, what, what for example Germany does, where you are able to kind of self-generate, um, you know, consume the power that you need. For example, in this case, up to 100 megawatts, um, or, or if you use 60 megawatts, say, and then the surplus can be sold back into the grid to Eskom. Or, or what is the thinking in that regard? The the the, the actual discussion was uh, based on the fact that. For self-generation for own use, there is no need for a license, and there is no limit. There is no hundred. There is nothing you can. Uh, if it's for own use, you can do it up to thousand, two thousand, whatever. There is no limit. The actual debate that made this debate polarized was the fact that people wanted uh, fifty at the time, uh, but wanted to have access to the to the grid. And I wanted to have the right to trade. And our argument was that you can't trade without license. Uh, uh, that debate absorbed us uh, until this decision was taken. The reality of the matter is that uh, the, the, this threshold is linked to access to the grid and ability to trade among themselves. That's why it is it must be registered and be given a permit by NERSA so that we can monitor what is happening in that space and not allow it to, to be a, just a free-for-all that can cause chaos. So that is what we, we, we are happy with. Uh, the, the, the schedule two uh, should be out by next week, I would imagine. I don't know. I'm not committing the officials to an impossible task. But that would be the issue. The issue is that allow them to trade if they want to trade. And the essence, actually, the reason that we we moved from 50 to 100 was that as we're discussing this issue, on our desk, there were three applications from three mining companies. One wanted 84 megawatts, one wanted 70, another one wanted 100 megawatts. Okay. And then we said, why do we uh liberalize this space but exclude these mining companies where there is a known demand sure. so we extend, we extend it to 100 because there is already a demand that is within the 100 megawatts that's what we, we that's why we took that decision fantastic 
Well, thank you very much, Minister, for your insight. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much, Baftik, for your questions. Uh, Minister, thank you so much and your team. Uh, so on the call, we, we had a bit of discussion. Uh, the renewables program, we know five, six, and seven, uh, the dates. And then the gas, uh, we also have sort of a visibility of what will be coming. I just wanted maybe uh, Jacob, maybe, or yourself to talk about the nuclear. What's the thinking there around the nuclear? Uh, leave that. Leave my team to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me go through you then. <laughs> leave, my team, leave my team to me. Yes. Uh, nuclear. Let me just introduce it by tongue to coal. Coal, though it is on the back foot at this point in time, we believe that there's still scope for uh, research on cleaner coal technologies so that we don't throw away this big resource that we have in our country. I don't know if uh, uh, Ndarembambo is there. Mbambo is, is, is Mbambo there? No, I'm not asking. Hmm? He's not. Okay. Uh, okay. Nuclear okay. is one of the most exciting field if you do your own quiet research uh, uh, to look into. And a lot of potential in South Africa. Sometimes when you talk of nuclear, Many people think of the project that was uh, collapsed of 9,600 megawatts with Russia uh, under President Zuma. And therefore, because of that project and the developments around it, uh, tend to discard nuclear. It's quite an exciting technology of the future, by the way. It has gone modular, and that makes it very, very attractive. To society, and we're going to have that. We say we have allocated the 2,500 uh, post 2030, uh, and uh, work is being done. We've issued a uh, request for information, and we received responses from 25 companies that were interested and uh, prepared to look into nuclear and take up the interest from various countries. And I think it is going to be a technology of the future. Uh, three major researchers uh, internationally came to a conclusion that actually the long-term future of renewables is partnering wind and PV with nuclear. That is where the long term is. Research is research. We look into it with interest. Uh, and uh, you'll find out that uh, many companies that wouldn't even be interested in nuclear are beginning to take up an interest now. Thank you so much uh, on that. On the uh, chat, we, we have some questions from Chiboni events, and some of them are, are, might be unfair to you, but it talks about uh, what will happen then to those mining towns when the power plants are decommissioned. Uh, is the ministry then talking to several players to see how they, those uh, power stations could be repurposed um, post the decommissioning? Uh, two weeks ago, uh, a team from the department uh, was in Mozambique. I led that team. One of the discussions we had was uh, because of the availability of gas, and the pipelines that are coming from Mozambique to Mpumalanga, we said it is going to be an interesting development to look into gas turbines to replace uh, coal turbines. Uh, and it's quite a serious proposition in the interim as a major uh, development for the transition. So that talks to the economies of those, of those towns. And what we are resisting as a department is to deal with uh, uh, a transition, a just transition, as just doing a COP there and doing this there, and into developing alternative economies in those areas. Pumalanga will collapse and die 
if we just close all the power stations there and develop no alternative economies. So we're looking into serious into alternative economies. The first power station will be good uh, areas of experiment, whether it is hot flay or Komati or Henrena or Camden. They will uh, give us space to experiment with gas turbines with access to gas that we hope will be having. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my next question is just regarding what what is your latest thinking regarding uh, cross border collaboration on hydropower and, for instance, for instance, about the Koharabasa from Mozambique, as well as the Grand Inga uh, um, from the DRC. And I think this also links up with another question that we've received from from Priyesh on the chat, where he asks what are the hurdles to overcome to make electricity generation from Inga possible? So if you can just address those those two questions, Minister, we'd appreciate that. So do you want to take those? I will add. No, thank you. Thank you. You can't go on holiday. You can't go on holiday to this one. I don't. <laughs> no, no, Minister. Uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, as Minister has uh, indicated, uh, we continue as a department to engage with the, you know, our uh, neighboring countries on various options for energy for, for the country. Kaurabasa is uh, one of those, uh, you know, uh, energy generation uh, plants that uh, is very beneficial to ESCOM, but also to, to the grid, both in terms of uh, cost, but also in terms of uh, stability uh, to, to the grid. There is work that is being done uh, with the DRC on INGA, uh, government is still, uh, the department is still committed uh, to making sure that uh, that uh, project comes to fruition. What I think uh, is helping uh, lately is that uh, there is uh, a lot more, I guess, stability from the, 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 the DRC in terms of governance. And uh, we believe that uh, through the engagements that are ongoing with the with the government, they, uh, we will be able to make sure that the, the, the project comes to fruition. Of course, having said that, there is also a lot of work that we still need to do uh, in terms of making sure that the transmission network uh, linked to that is also put into, into place. Thank you. Thanks, Honorable. Yeah, the, well, what I can add is that what makes us not certain is that the primary drive of that development as granted by the DRC are actually Spain and China, who have been forced to work together to develop Inga. But we have a unit that is located there, is based there, is working there. But the primary drivers of that development, given by the government of the DRC, is China and Spain. And that gave us uh, uncertainty in terms of being having our hands in the parts of the project, but we're still very committed to the project. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I suspect that um, our colleague Shelley uh, could have another question um, around question seven. Thank you, Steve. Um, Honorable Minister, um, taking into consideration that we're looking at a few alternative mixes of energy for South Africa, um, would it mean that the cost of electricity would hopefully reduce, you know, for for households, for, um, you know, for companies, um, for municipalities, etc.? Or is this still a long way to go before we get to some cheaper electricity prices for all? One of the things that uh, uh, I, I don't like 
uh, is to uh, say projections, treat them as certain. You know, I have been bombarded by uh, a lobbyist uh, of renewables that it is going to be cheap into the future. Uh, and we all made to believe that it's going to be cheap. Uh, I believe it, but the reality is that uh, between the one, two, and three are costing ESCOM uh, an average of 220 cents, but sell the project 8, 9 cents. And to me, it doesn't make arithmetic sense, it doesn't make economic sense, but it is happening. And that's why I fight with my colleagues in government that listen, don't, when you give money to ESCO, don't call it a bailout, call it a subsidy for a technology that you wanted in the economy. And just give that money as a subsidy, not as a bailout. So moving to the future, it depends on the combination of technologies that we're going to have. Uh, 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 I was uh, saying this is an administrative price, but we give it an increase of 15% for 2021 and 15% for 2022 through the courts. And to me, it is making it uh, inaccessible. And that debate is the hottest debate in the government sector. I don't see public participating in that debate, but my own view, one of the things that helped us industrialize earlier was the low cost uh, theory of the past. That lowest cost theory, actually in 1993, ESCOM was uh, among the three lowest cost electricities in the world. You cannot say that today. Uh, it is quite expensive. Uh, we need to do something about that because we can't talk industrialization and increasing electricity cost through the roof because you won't achieve it, that combination doesn't work. And I always talk to, to, to my colleague in TPE, uh, uh, Comrade Praveen. I said, Comrade Praveen, you are running a strange entity that goes about my uh, uh, advertising that buy less of my product, buy less of my price. Only ESCOM that does that. And when the, 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 the price, when the demand goes down, the price goes up. Is, it, it defies all economic logic, but it's an issue that will depend on us getting the right combination of electricity generation. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, thank you, Shady and the Minister. Um, we've got two questions from, from our audience, one from Gerald, where he asks, or he actually comments that um, the requirements for for nurse or for licensing for SEGs is extremely laborious and is not encouraging smaller players to participate. Uh, can this process please be reviewed, Mr. Minister, if you can comment on that? And then Blondie uh, Machata says, Minister, I'm also interested in finding out where the battery energy storage system process is at Eskom. The bid timelines are too short for bidders. Um, so, Minister, if you can address those two questions from our audience. Um, one of the commitments we've made to the president, so when we make that commitment to the president, it's a deal, was that, okay, uh, uh, raise the threshold. We are committing to you that processing any permit will not take to more than two months. That remains a deal on the table. Um, so uh, you can continue beating us about the history and the past, but that commitment stands now. As we release those uh, schedules, they will go with that commitment. So the laborious, NASA licensing is too laborious. I, okay, maybe then, but we, we were committed to a shorter process to the permitting. Let me use the term that was used by the president, permitting. Uh, I still try to grapple with the difference between permitting and licensing, but fine. Two months is the maximum that we're tested with. Uh, if it is too high a, a hill to climb, there's something else, but we have made that commitment. Uh, battery storage in ESCOM, Zimbabwe, what is that? Um, yes, Minister. Um, 
the ESCOM battery storage procurement is an ESCOM process and uh, within obviously ESCOM timelines. Um, I don't think as a department we can dictate or tell ESCOM um, to change their timelines. But as a department, we also intend to issue a battery storage uh, RFP as later around August, September of this year as part of the bidding programs that, that we run. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister, with your team. Uh, we've addressed coal, we went to gas, we went to renewables. Uh, Lulama also added hydro and um, the cross-border collaboration. I just wanted to close one question under your in the ministry, the department. Shelley had asked about uh, Petro SA, but sen uh, currently we saw Central Energy Fund uh, exercise their preemptive. Uh, rights on the Romco uh, pipeline transaction. Do you see Central Energy Fund playing a major role in the electricity landscape going forward? They've been, I guess the question comes because they've been sort of quiet in the past and uh, we're seeing some activity in that point, in that space. Now, maybe let me give you the structure. Uh, Central Energy Fund is the holding company. Petro SA, SFF, I guess, uh, Afghan Exploration, plus uh, all subsidiaries. So when the activities in those areas, we must know that SEF is alive. Uh, and uh, it uh, exercises the preemptive right, but that preemptive right is exercised on behalf of I guess. And the reason that we, 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 we use that preemptive right, we believe that we need to have a strong state for the private sector to flourish. A weak state is an irritation to the private sector. We need to have a, a stronger hand on the network so that companies can begin to exercise uh, their business uh, options. Like for example, I talked of uh, gas turbines in Pumalanga. If we have that pipeline, Gas turbines are a possibility. The private sector can begin to look into opportunities in that area. So self is always alive, is there all the time. All these subsidiaries are actually under self. The measure of the three is consolidation of a number of those subsidiaries under self. Thank you so much for that clarity, uh, uh, well un understood. And uh, we're seeing Paul and uh, uh, Kandani from uh, uh, the, the, the chat. Uh, we'll combine the two questions. Why can't ESCOM bid for this uh, uh, renewable uh, uh, energy as well? There's a, there's a view that perhaps they could, that they could do that cheaper themselves. And uh, Paul says, may a municipality contract with uh, an IPP of a simple competitive power purchase agreement basis instead of having a, a, to procure through the triple P process. So I guess he's saying the municipality, can they go through an IPP process rather than the triple P process? This is Paul. Let me abuse him to Bale again. Bale, deal with them. Um, yes, um, with, the, with the first one, um, ESCOM does not participate as a bidder in the process uh, that we run for uh, IPPs because ESCOM's role is the role of a buyer. But um, ESCOM can build um, their own uh, renewable energy plants and um, we've been in discussions with them. They are working on a number of uh, opportunities that they would want to pursue. Um, in terms of um, municipalities, Yes, um, there are a number of options for municipalities. I'm aware that uh, a number of municipalities are working on a, a IPP program where they just procure the energy uh, and not uh, go in the form of a PPP. So it's an option that a number of municipalities are looking at. So there is nothing that stops them from uh, looking at uh, that option of procurement. Thank you. That's it. And... Uh... One of the things that is never talked about is the fact that rules were amended to give municipalities 
right to procure their energy or generate their energy. Rules were published by our department and we have not had a single municipality that have exercised that option. We have been threatened by about Stellan Bosch will be the first that we have not seen it. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Thanks, Minister. We've got a question from someone with the acronym TR. And the question is that given the potential of hydrogen fuel cells, why are we not putting efforts into this as it provides an opportunity to revive the platinum market? I don't know when uh, a person say we're not putting an effort into it. What does that mean? Because I know that Anglo Platinum is having a project on uh, hydrogen uh, energy cells. I know that there was this project that was announced about Sasson and ITC. I don't know which efforts I will not put in. Well, that is definitely part of the energy mix. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, I guess in the municipal space, even this 100 megawatt uh, will starting to uh, make them uh, think uh, differently around the energy energy procurement and i'm looking at uh, big municipalities Joburg, cape town uh, Tswane. i'm sure now they will be coming to you to to explore uh, ways in which uh, uh, this this could be done let me also uh, go let me also go to our friends uh, check if uh, tns and uh, baftic have sort of the closing questions. Anyone with a question will just uh, show up there as we get into our close. Yeah. Bhakti, go for it. Oh, no, nothing further from me. I was just going to say, Jen, please go ahead. Thank no, you. no, I have nothing else. Uh, Minister, we, we look forward to these uh, procurement programs getting launched. Um, so nothing else. Thanks. Thanks for the responses. Thank you very much, Minister. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Bavtik and Tians. Thanks, Bavtik and Tians. Um, we'll ask the last few questions from our, from our chat group before we close. Um, there's been a question around the security of supply for liquid fuels is important for the country. Can this be achieved by refining Im importation of refined products or combination thereof? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, we believe that uh, we need a very strong base in as far as uh, refining is concerned. So uh, there has to be a balance between importation and uh, and uh, local refiner refining but because of the distance from refining centers uh, south africa is far from many major refining centers so it is important that uh, we have a very strong refining uh, uh, sector particularly inland because uh, most of our economic activity other other uh, you know in terms of uh, our country uh, is uh, inland, so we cannot afford not to have security of supply to the inland region. And that you can only uh, uh, assure when you have a refining activity in your country. I mean, as recent as last week, certain vessels could not uh, you know, bath in uh, in uh, Saldana to deliver LPG, and uh, the, the the western part of the country has now um, is going to have to rely on the inland part for the supply of LPG. That just shows you that uh, you always need to have your own level of refining in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, response. And thank you, for Minister, for coming also with your team. Is there anything that uh, uh, perhaps is bubbling on your side that uh, 
the panel and the questions that were streamed did not uh, come through, but it's quite exciting to you that uh, maybe you want to yes. uh, leave it out. No, the energy space is exciting in itself. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing that I always uh, try to persuade people from is that energy debates are polarized. Uh, and I think that deprives society of the optimal benefit of this sector, which has a big potential to grow, uh, because we're fighting on anything and everything. Uh, we are suboptimal. To me, the issue that I, I would, if I would manage it, would be to take polarization of the discussion out and allow people to discuss scientifically. Uh, researchers must throw papers and they must persuade us and define the transition that is sustainable rather than think that you can move like a pendulum from one extreme to the other. That's it. Okay, Dox, and Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Minister. Um, I mean, I think you obviously have a, 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 your, you know, your work cut out for you and you've got a, quite a challenging um, ministry at your hands. And we appreciate all the, all the hard work and efforts and plans that, that are in place. Um, obviously, South Africa, you know, see, and, and the you know, industry as well as the, the public, um, you know, sees or experiences some of these uh, consistent, you know, load shedding and, 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 and rolling blackouts, which, are for, which affect obviously their households as well as economies. But we're obviously mindful of the incredible work that your department is doing. And we want to commend you on, on that and, and the strides that are making. And hopefully um, this, this too will pass in terms of the, 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 you know, the, the, the load shedding that we're experiencing. So um, I think I'll, I'll hand over to, to Stephen. But we'd like to definitely thank you and your team for your participation today and the insightful discussion, as well as, well as our, uh, our audience who, who were very um, you know, participatory in, in today's deliberations. So over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Lulama. And yes, uh, Minister, we also do agree that in the, the ESG policy, we need to uh, make sure that the environmental is not overly emphasized against the sustainability. Uh, so, so I do agree with you that there should be a model that makes sure that um, we don't go into a California stage or Sweden stage where we have moved too quick and too fast uh, that we then experience uh, sort of um, electricity outrages as we transform um, to more cleaner, uh, cleaner energy. So thank you, Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come now to the end of the constructive conversation. On behalf of APSA Group, I would like to sincerely thank you, Minister, for your, for your time to engage uh, with us. I know that you had challenges on the, on the time but you really wanted us uh, to have this conversation and uh, thank God we are here at, uh, and we had it. And uh, it just shows the importance to business, the South African economy and society as, as large. We thank you for your openness and your willingness to engage with the various stakeholders on this call. We are encouraged by the strife that government is taking to address our energy challenges. Uh, to the audience, thank you for choosing to be with us this afternoon in your busy schedules. We hope that you found the discussion valuable and now have a better sense of where we are headed uh, from the energy space. Uh, to my team at APSA, uh, thank you for your hard work and dedication and for making today a success. Once again, please accept my uh, sincere apologies for the changes of the time. Uh, thank you, everyone. A great afternoon and uh, goodbye. Thank you so much, Minister, and your team. Uh, hi, Minister. Tata, Mantashe? Sia Bulel? Ah, it's living. Yeah. Couldn't hear us. Yeah.